say um, that uh, since I'm the final reader, I want to give another shout out to Howard. Howard. Um, Howard. Yeah. Howard. 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 Howard and I met uh, actually in New York City when we were in grad school together. Um, and so it's very interesting that we actually came back together and ended up uh, working together to hopefully, there he is, there's Howard. Howard! I was saying that we uh, met in New York City in our grad school program, interestingly sure. enough, and then reconnected in West Virginia. Um, and so I'm very happy about that. I just want to make sure that Howard and all the people that work with him get the recognition for this very big and important thing that he's doing within our community. Um, and I say our community within West Virginia, which is really an enormous community and seemingly a huge county. So a round of applause for our Thank you all. All right, so um, I'm going to read an essay uh, that I recently had published called Black Trash. It clocks in at nine minutes, so I'm going to try to get through it in that time so I can get you guys out of here. I remember a time when all I wanted was to be trash. Trash like the kind you see on TV, no concern for a future, no concern for legacy, no concern for a healthy life. Where I come from, our parents tell us, never forget where you come from, to never get above your raisin. But I wanted to get, get beneath mine, down, underneath, underground, sit among the people no one else knows how to help because they don't seem to try to help themselves. I wanted to try to be the other kind of Appalachian, the kind people my parents warned me about, the kind you see on television skipping church and drinking Bud Light on their porch at 2 in the afternoon, the kind who chomp on our crunchy Appalachian words as hard as they can, speaking English underneath the world's English subtitles. The kid, the kind who live hard and don't fear hell because they figure it couldn't be much worse than the lives and the places and the ideas they were born into. The kind my 12th grade English teacher said I might become if I didn't learn to ease up on myself and relax a little. That person inside me I denied but that she could see bubbling in the places I didn't want to look. I once told her, hovering over her desk, not yet understanding her beauty or that cliché yet true wisdom that comes with age and knowledge that she was wrong even though one day she'd be so right. Where I come from, it's always that dichotomy, the world already set up for us, one or the other, black or white, blue or red, good or bad, in or out, here or there, way, way out there. Rich or poor, city or country, northern or southern, real Appalachian or not Appalachian enough. This isn't reality, even though some people want that simple vision, need that clear line to be real. I didn't know any better back then, but that line didn't need to be there. Back then, I still wanted to see it. I was interested in the other side. I was interested in the other side, the one so many Appalachians said needed Jesus. I hope they find Jesus one day. I hope they find peace, they say. But I never understood what they meant because all the people I knew who said they actually had Jesus in their heart seemed anything but peaceful. I never understood what that meant because one thing I know for sure is Appalachian people need a hell of a lot more than faith. So all I can figure out is that is within this you with us or you ain't place was to try to be both lean into the sense of fatalism that ties our Appalachian people together me but more interesting me but dirtier me but less Reba and more Tang and Tucker my favorite country singer as a child who my dad used to say seemed like a rough woman but I loved her I think it began when I was 18 and I just left home midday packing all I could into the Honda Civic my dad owned so I could leave for good. My clean Christian parents were out of town. It wasn't the best way to leave, but that's exactly what I did. I went to my sister's and lived with Sissy and her then husband for as long as I could deal with his husbandness. It wasn't even a true break because I still needed the people I left behind, though I tried to convince myself I didn't. 
I would eventually understand I was running from and to the wrong things. I wanted nothing more than to know what it felt like to be trash. That's all I could think about, and even though I hid my obsession well for a while, I know now that what I really wanted was to not matter. Back then, all I knew that I all I knew was that I wanted people to stop expecting me to do something great. I didn't want to hide depression or anxiety or panic attacks or thoughts of ending it. I wanted to not be exceptional. I wanted the anonymity of average. I didn't want anyone to look up to me anymore, and I didn't want to be responsible for the respectability of the family's name or my own. I didn't want to honor a God. I didn't much feel or believe anymore. My family, they were good at Appalachian, a large body of religious teetotalers, all or nothing kind of people. I never felt like I was really one of them, but I understood who they were, and they were mostly good. I wanted to try to be trash, or at least dip my toes in its muck. Becoming trash is pretty easy, no matter how far out from it you start, especially if you're all right or staying up way too late and pushing way too many liquids through your body as though your body were a brittle pitcher that filters out the bad in the night, waiting inside your fridge so you wake up in the good in the morning. I used to try to make myself feel better about slipping into this way of life by picturing my body as a Brita. Mmm, refreshing. Replenishing revival. I am new, I am a new woman. I'm clean, baptized by the coal flex in that filter. I used to think the little black things in the Brita pitcher were coal, but it turns out they aren't. I remember when I'd take a bath in my best friend's bathtub in East Lynn, West Virginia, sometime in middle school, and the well water would be yellowish and thick with black specks. I loved the oil of it. I felt sanctified, bathing in what I thought was freckled with coal, tiny bits of what so many believe is West Virginia gold. Looking back, it makes me think of all the people, too, who believe coal will save them because of all the lies that some rich men told them and tells them it will keep telling them. Believing in coal, in false promises of prosperity, in false prophets, is convenient. Sometimes we put all our faith in what's hopeless and most fulfilling in the moment, even if we know it's going to kill us in the end. The absence of coal sounds like a faucet turned on without a liquid to fill and feel. Coal is not just an object. It's a mindset, a way of life, both concrete and abstract. It is sacred in a place where not much is sacred anymore. We see that pain in each other's faces. Behind our faces are our father's faces and their father's faces and the faces of all the women who waited on them to come home. There's a picture of my papal steel standing on an old swinging bridge in East Lynn, not far from where I take oil baptism baths decades later, with his face covered in coal dust. In it, he smiles, eternal. I imagine my mammal waiting on him to come home, cold cloth in hand. Wipe it away, Dad. Take a bath. Dinner is cold. He was a husband to a wife who called him dad, to a wife he called mom, who was a mother of 16, who was a mother to my father, number 13, who is my humble and hardened and loving father, who has been shaped by years of coal, of farming, of trucking, of timbering, of preaching that my grandfather took on to give him and my family life, even if it's a life most of their many children will want to leave. We can wash away that coal dust, empty that coal sludge, deny our past all we want, but it's still in our veins, in our blood, in the water that flows and creeks and makes up most of our bodies. They don't tell you until it's too late that the trash in the water, those toxins, build up over time. We drink it anyway. We take what we can get. We put it through a filter. We put it through our bodies. Then we can't see it. For we live by faith, not by sight. I can still hear my papal say it. Science is one thing, but if you have faith in, faith in the unknown, in the powers above you, with enough coal sediment, or whatever the shit you put in your Brita pitcher, you can cleanse your body or whatever you did to it, whatever they've done to it, right? According to that logic, it doesn't matter how much shit you pump with the air or the water or the ground or in our heads. We can find a filter clean us up. Let's make America great again. Britta, 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 coal, 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 consume, consume, consume.
Say it three times and the Savior will come to you, I guess. Clean us. Wash our dirty faces and wash away our sins. Take out the trash in your yards and in our 